Um, let's try to switch to um, Manila, to the Philippines, and then we're going to talk. Uh, we're not going to have much of a talk with John, because John's giving his presentation. He's from Consensive and the transactions, uh, Transactive Grid. He's been working uh, his, the last years to say, hey, in the energy world, we're going to have a completely different way of um, completely different way to produce energy and to buy energy, and we're going to have these uh, groups together. So I'm going to ask him, and you can start talking in eight seconds because that's about the delay we have, uh, you know, for the live stream because that's what he's listened to. I would really love to know how the energy sector is going to be changed by the blockchain. So uh, give him a big hand, John Lilich. Thanks, guys. I, I think I can actually hear you in real time now, uh, so somehow it seems to be working. Um, so uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I just wanted to sort of talk a little bit about uh, uh, the energy sector and the potential utility of the Ethereum blockchain in that space. Um, so maybe uh, just kind of get started. Uh, a little bit of context here. Um, we're witnessing a pretty interesting phenomenon as the physical infrastructure of the grid is actually decentralizing. Um, we are seeing consumers become prosumers, and most notably the cost of photovoltaic systems, solar panels, has dramatically decreased. Um, we're seeing tremendous proliferation all over the place. Germany is one example, of course, Holland as well. Um, aside from that, we're seeing tremendous um, development in battery tech, storage technology as well. Uh, batteries are performing better, they're getting cheaper. And so um, that sort of net effect is, uh, along with a bunch of other factors, is sort of changing the utility business model uh, pretty quickly here. Um, and so as the physical infrastructure of grid decentralizes, an interesting sort of proposition to consider is what types of new business logic layers can we build on top of that? And that's where, as it turns out, Ethereum can potentially very elegantly express um, itself in that context. Um, so uh, this just this first slide here, um, Ethereum blockchain over you. I guess you guys have been talking about the blockchain all day. I'll, I'll just give a little bit of historical context. Um, Post-World War II, uh, going back in time a little bit, American corporations started adopting computers into the business process. And very quickly, a problem emerged, basically all this data um, needed to be structured, organized, queried, uh, made useful. And this is basically where the notion of the database came from. Um, and then pushing into the 60s and 70s, there was demand to start sort of connecting all these different databases. Um, and that roughly gave the rise of the network. Um, and on top of this database network sort of infrastructure, we start building applications that kind of look like the modern internet. Uh, and as the digital economy continues to sort of uh, grow and uh, basically become extremely relevant in our daily lives, we start to see friction points start to emerge. Um, one kind of glaring example is this couple billion people that don't have access to basic financial services. And what the blockchain fundamentally does is it takes the network and the database and it makes them coterminous. They're sort of somehow one. Um, and in this context, um, with the Bitcoin blockchain and certainly with Ethereum, with thousands of computers all over the world um, that constitute the network. And each one of those computers has uh, a shared database. And at predictable time intervals, they agree on the state of the database. Um, Ethereum adds an additional dimension because Ethereum nodes also run the same computationally complete virtual environment. And so in that context, Ethereum is very often referred to, I guess, as sort of a shared global IT infrastructure or world computer, if you will, or at least the genesis of one anyway. Um, and so uh, going back to this slide, there's some properties inherent to that uh, system, of course, the cryptographically secured, decentralized, immutable ledger, the notion of smart contracts, et cetera. Um, I guess going to the next slide here, um, these are some more sort of blockchain characteristics kind of digitized, decentralized, programmable, secure, mutable, et cetera. I'm, I'm sure you've heard quite a bit about this stuff all day. Um, as far as going to the next slide, please. Um, with respect to blockchain configurations, we, of course, have a public network. Um, we've got this notion of uh, private blockchains. Um, 
sure you've heard quite a bit about private permission ledgers. And then, of course, consortium sort of blockchains where they can all kind of talk to each other. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so going into the energy stuff, um, just to back up a little bit, as, as I mentioned earlier, sort of we're witnessing the physical infrastructure of the grid decentralized, and we're seeing a lot of utilities, um, frankly speaking, uh, taking a hard look at their business models and trying to figure out um, exactly what to do. Um, in, in, in many instances, lots of utilities are seeing, uh, for example, their power production business uh, dramatically declining. Um, you're seeing their retail business, uh, which is very competitive, low margin, sort of having a hard time competing. Um, trading as well can be volatile and um, We've seen, uh, I'm sure, many examples in the financial services sector where the blockchain can add value in a trading context. The same applies in the energy sector. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're seeing this kind of dramatic change. And where Ethereum becomes quite interesting is it can, um, well, it can offer some pretty interesting uh, uh, utility to the utilities. Uh, from an operational supremacy standpoint, um, from a customer intimacy standpoint, um, we can now start to think about connecting prosumers, so those are consumers with generative capacity, to local buyers, uh, sort of directly. Um, and the way we do that is uh, every prosumer that has a photovoltaic system um, also has a smart meter. And the smart meter calculates your production and consumption profile. And if you produce more than you consume, um, those electrons get fed into the grid. Um, and so what we can do is we can sync into that smart meter and we can generate tokens, um, basically just like Ether, um, that represent that generative capacity. And so now you as a prosumer can, um, across the network, sell on your generative capacity to your neighbor or local businesses or whatever the case may be. Um, and, and the reason you want to do that is because when you localize um, in that context, you map on more closely to what physics tells us is actually happening with those electrons. And electrons don't really travel great distances very efficiently. Um, they basically have a tendency to go to the nearest load. And so if you are generating power and feeding your surplus back into the grid, chances are those electrons are going to your neighbor's refrigerator. And so if your neighbor has the opportunity to purchase um, that power from you, you have some pretty interesting qualities there because you reduce transmission loss and you sort of localize the environmental and economic benefit of that locally generated um, clean power. Uh, so let's just go to the next slide. These are just some high level thoughts about kind of what the decentralized energy customer journey looks like. And of course, um, decentralization or the notion of decentralization is kind of central. Um, locality, kind of what I just mentioned. Um, renewable energy is a big deal here. We're, we're all about kind of clean tech and helping proliferate clean tech. Um, and, and then, of course, this notion of the sharing economy. And we've seen, the, you know, uh, it's a cliche at this point, Airbnb, Uber, et cetera. Um, well, it, we've yet to see... Um, in the energy sector, something along those lines that really enables this notion of the um, sharing economy. And we think Ethereum has the potential to uh, change that a little bit. Um, just real quick, as far as what I mentioned earlier, um, this is really a technology and an economics issue. Um, our good friends in China some time ago just decreed we will have solar, so they started producing uh, at very large scales, driving the cost down. Um, and, and of course, the technology itself continues to improve. And so um, it's inevitable that uh, more and more people will install generative capacity into the facilities and become uh, prosumers. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic that, uh, that bodes well for the energy, uh, for, for our energy independence going forward. Um, so just, just the next slide, I guess I'll give a bit more detail in terms of what we're actually trying to do here. Um, so the prosumer uh, will, Sort of, uh, and again, we sync into the smart meter and sort of the uh, generation and consumption profile. Um, from there, the prosumer will have the choice to allocate their 
generative capacity to um, basically wherever they want. Um, one of the things that we've been considering alongside our, our partners out of UE in, in Germany is um, giving the prosumer a few different options. Perhaps they might want to donate uh, their generative capacity, whether it's to a local nonprofit or a kindergarten or something like that, or perhaps they want to put their generative capacity, effectively those tokens, into a local pool for local businesses to bid against, or maybe there's potential to match uh, the generative capacity to um, you, you know the the the, the uh, sort of generative load profile of the photovoltaic system to a uh, low profile, uh, a low consumption profile from something like a supermarket, let's say, for example. Um, and so in this way, we can kind of connect the prosumer directly to the end uh, sort of consumer, the off taker. Um, I guess the next slide, please. Uh, I'll just really quickly try to talk about the notion of self sovereign identity. And that's, that's a very powerful notion, and it's kind of one of the foundational things we should be our thinking. Uh, on with respect to what Ethereum is and what its utility is. And so if we think about Facebook, Facebook is essentially a container for identity. You create a profile, you upload attributes uh, that describe who you are, where you work, your relationship, etc. And others make attestations, your friends, when they say happy birthday, when you have a photo, they attest to, hey, I know that's you. And over time, um, your Facebook profile develops this notion of identity because you've got a bunch of attributes and attestations. And sometimes Facebook lets you um, sort of have this notion of transitive identity. You can log into Airbnb with your Facebook, for example. But the uh, transitive uh, qualities of your Facebook identity are not persistent. You can't take them everywhere. And if Facebook deletes your account, you kind of lose your identity. And, and the same for LinkedIn and Twitter and so on. Um, on the blockchain, you can do something a little bit uh, that kind of flips this notion on its head and empowers the user. You can make an assertion on the blockchain um, sort of describing your canonical identity, you can first upload attributes, describe who you are. Those can be biometrics, they can be a, a scan of your, uh, 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 like address documents, whatever the case is. Um, and you can sort of, uh, in the form of persona constructs, um, depending on the context of the transaction you're in, um, give access to those attributes. So maybe you want to open a bank account and you need a financial services persona that satisfies the KYC AMO requirement. But maybe you're also a gamer and you play Xbox Live and maybe Xbox 360 Live doesn't you know the same things that the bank does, but, um, and, and, and so forth. And then also we can introduce this notion of attestations where others can attest to um, the validity of the attributes to describe who you are. Like you could go to the post office, show them your ID, and they could cryptographically sign against your ID saying, yes, we've seen these documents and we attested the, their validity. And so you can imagine a constellation of attestations against various attributes forming this rich notion of identity. And because you have the private key that unlocks access to those corresponding attributes and attestations on the blockchain, you are in full control of your identity and you can take your identity with you everywhere. So now it becomes persistent and transitive. Um, but what's really interesting is we can also, in, in addition to people, sort of that works for devices as well. And so in this context, with this slide that you're looking at, the with the self-sovereign identity thing, the prosumers' interactions on the blockchain unlocking various business processes, such as selling on their tokens, uh, allocating their generative capacity to wherever, um, those business processes are unlocked um, by their identity, basically. And, and same with their smart meter. We can sort of have assurances that this meter belongs to this person at this location, and um, all of that can be anchored in this notion of self-sovereign identity, which kind of allows the whole thing to sort of work. Um, and that little sort of diagram there that says Ethereum blockchain and smart contracts, that's kind of where all the magic happens. And from an institutional perspective, as a utility, that's that's really interesting because it allows utilities to do different things um, and offer different sorts of business processes. Uh, okay, so I think I'm getting kicked off, <laughs> but uh, thank you all very much for your time. <laughs> hey, John, if I ask you a question, how long does it take you to answer, or is he already gone? Uh, sorry, how long does it take? Yeah, so you can hear me live, uh, right? You can hear me live. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so 
we're totally excited to basically have all the identities. We had a fantastic story about the identity and uh, you did it the same thing with the Internet of Things. How long will this be uh, taken before it's practical that our devices will basically start trading in, uh, in the name of our identity, of their own identity, in contracts in this energy market? How slow will this market go from uh, developing? You know, is, will it be just as slow as the video which comes from Manila to here because the sound is pretty horrible? But can you give us some perspective? Sure. So I think um, it's important to have some understanding as far as what the Ethereum scalability roadmap looks like going forward. And that can kind of help inform what the time frame looks like before we're able to achieve uh, some semblance of scale that allows for this sort of thing to happen. Um, well, I'm, not afraid. Context, I'm certainly... not afraid of Ethereum. I'm afraid of the world and the energy companies and the prosumers and the usability and, and the people who come forward to, this, uh, this, to, to build a system like that. It can start slow and move forward. How long will that take in the energy market? Uh, well, so that's a tricky question, but it'll definitely be slower than the financial services market. The frequency of the grid is like a matter of national security, and we can't get things wrong because stuff might blow up. So <laughs> you know, we have to kind of assume at least it'll be slower than what we're seeing in the financial services sector. But many utilities and energy sector players are currently looking at Ethereum, and, and, uh, and, and I think we'll see uh, continued acceleration. Okay. Thank you very much, John. I'm glad you're, uh, you're feeling better than yesterday, and we appreciate you coming from Manila. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.